Hi, I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. And with us today, we have Senator John Legg from the 17th District here in Florida. Thank How you, Bill. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How long have you been in the state Senate? Well, it's been less than a year now. It took office last November, and as of right now, it's October. So we've been there in about 11 months. Who, who did you replace? It was a, it's a redistricting district uh, because okay. we went through redistricting, but the bulk of the district was under a, a former state senator, uh, Jim Norman. It's his, it would be mo most considered his former district. Former district? It, it, this redistricting, I, I, with myself, I had everybody pretty well put <laughs> where they were. And it becomes a little more difficult now, but I'll learn it along is, with everybody else. It's a little bit of alignment. The district comprises of basically everything north of Tampa International Airport in Hillsborough County to halfway through Pasco County, uh, wow. State Road 52. So it's, it's a fairly large district encompassing Lutz, uh, Trinity, Zephyr Hills, Wesley Chapel, uh, West Chase, Citrus Park uh, areas. Wow, and if you forgot somebody, you're in deep trouble. I'm in deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> this is not your first run in politics, though. No, it's not. I, I had the good fortune of representing uh, the uh, floor in the Florida House, House District 46, which was primarily in West Pasco. Uh, so this district is uh, shifted a little bit further central and more Tampa area in the state Senate, but I represented the uh, in the Florida House for eight years. I know it's not the $29,000 a year. By the way, that's what a state representative or, or a state, uh, state senator gets is $29,000 a year to run his office or to be in office. I, I know it's not that. Why would you subject yourself to all the grief that it takes to run in politics and to hold office? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I mean, obviously it's not the money. I mean, the money uh, actually, it, barely covers the expenses of, of uh, being in office, but you do it because you want to make a difference in the world. You want to, you know, I have five children and, you know, I want to make really? sure, yeah, I want to make sure that they have a, a, a bright future. And uh, as my father did for me, I want to make sure that they have opportunities that I may never have had. And just like I have had opportunities that my family and my father never had. You know, I, I've had people say, well, 29,000, that's a lot of money. But yours isn't a seven day a week, or I mean a, a nine to five, four, five day a week job for a small section of time when you run up to Tallahassee. You're on duty all the time. And, uh, it, you know, it is, I mean, it's a, it's a labor of love. Uh, uh, we do it because we, we believe in it. Uh, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, all the, all the elected officials, they do it because they want to make a difference. Uh, and, and leave the world a little bit better for tomorrow. But it is, it is a, it is a full-time deal, and especially in the, the Florida Senate, uh, we get to pay the same as they get in the Florida House, and right. we represent three times as many right. folks, close to, close to 600,000 people. Um, you know, we, our calendar is very busy. We travel uh, quite a bit. Uh, we, we, will, we'll, we never say no. Uh, we always look at uh, helping individuals and going places if they allow us to, to come and help. So um, it is very busy. I have to admit your aide, Spencer, was very helpful to Pam here, Pam Garon, who is the generalissimo here in the station. She does a great job uh, of getting you on the program. Well, thank you. I mean, the, the one thing that we have, and I'm a big believer, is, is it's a team. And the, the state senate, while, while uh, uh, we are, we are considered part time. We all we do have full time professional staff. That I will tell you that, that they make our job possible. We have Rich Reedy, who used to be actually with the Hillsborough County yes, Commission. Yes, he did. I know Rich. He's Rich, a great guy, uh, veteran of many many years. Uh, um, he is in our office helping us out and ensuring that we stay on the straight and narrow path. We have Spencer Pilant, who is with us, a University of Florida grad, young individual who is helping us ensure on policy and working with us in Tallahassee on issues, and Becky Zizzo helping us with constituents. I'm sure Rich was helpful with Pam Garan also because we've dealt with Rich back and forth with the county commissioners. Uh, Rich, Rich does a great job. He's new with us. He's been with us since October, 1st of October, so he's still getting adjusted in our office, uh, but he does an amazing job. What do you do in the real world? What I do in the real world, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher. Uh, really? I, I've been a teacher for, gosh, 15 years now. Um, uh, I teach middle school and uh, high school government and history. 
Um, but what I, what, uh, my real claim to fame, I guess, if you will, about 15 years ago, my wife and I, we started a, a small little charter school in Pasco County. Really? Uh, called Day Spring Academy. We have about 650 students. Uh, we are a high performing school, uh, have been ever since we first started. We have one of the high, highest FCATs in the area, FCAT scores in the area. Um, long waiting list of over a thousand students trying to get into our school. Uh, we target low income students and in low income areas is uh, where, we're, where uh, we feel our need is. Um, and we focus on the arts and technology is where we're focused on. I know a lot of our people don't understand what a charter school is. I, in fact, I'm playing catch up on learning myself. Mm -hmm. But would you explain a charter school and how the state of Florida has allowed charter schools to become in the state? Sure, and, and there's different types of charter schools. Uh, our particular charter school that we have is, is a, really it's a, it's a school that's run by the community. It was 15 years ago, it was myself and other teachers in the community saw a need for an arts-focused school. Uh, not that the public, traditional public schools are doing a poor job, it's just there was no immersion into the arts. And our charter school is not owned by me or any one individual, it's owned by the community. It's a community school really? that all the parents are on the board of directors. Uh, they hire and fire the uh, administrators as they see fit. So the board of directors changes regularly as every, children graduate? Uh, absolutely, they serve on three year terms and every board of our board of directors ha has a child in the school. It's one of what, how they operate. Uh, so we feel as though it's parent driven. So the parents run the school, they have the vision, uh, they hire and fire uh, the administrators as they see fit, myself included. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's a really a community driven aspect. There's other types of charter schools that are run by management companies or other aspects. Uh, I personally view that the ones such as, ones that are run by the community such as Pepin Academies here in Hillsborough that serve as special needs or a day spring which is focused on the arts, tend to have higher success rates because they're more mobile and more accountable to the parents that are in the community. But uh, it's like Baskin Robbins. You know, no one flavor fits everyone and takes different styles to fit different children's needs. But, but the teachers are not part of the, for instance, if it was in Hillsborough or Pasco County, they're not part of the teachers of the school system for that county. Uh, no, they're not considered a, a part of this, the, the, the school district teachers, but they're all uh, certified teachers. Uh, we pay our teachers actually a little bit more than what the traditional school t districts do, and we have different incentives and different mo uh, bonuses for them. Um, but they're not part of the traditional teachers union, if you will. They're all well, private hired teachers that are state certified background screening uh, teachers. How, how do they fund this school? It's, it's funded a little bit less, believe it or not, than traditional public schools. Uh, it, the, the but it comes out of the Hillsborough Education Fund, correct? Correct. They, it all comes out of the traditional FEFP, it's called, at a state level. And it's about 85 cents on the dollar of a traditional public school. Really? Yes. And you, you can pay your children or teachers more? We do, and, and we'll, the reason why we're able to have a little bit more money in terms of area to put it into teachers' pockets and into the classroom is that we don't have to be all things to all people. Um, and, and it's the luxury of a charter now, school. Do you have to take, for instance, if somebody is handicapped in any way, shape, or form, or has a disability, do you have to take that student? Yes, we take all learning disability students, uh, any student that has challenges. Now, I will say, put a caveat, if they're called level four, meaning that if they require a nurse with them 24 hours a day, the, the extreme disabilities, we're not equipped to, to do the extreme disabilities. But learning disabilities, special needs, those type of non-extreme disabilities uh, that don't require a nurse on site 24 hours okay. uh, with the student, we're able to accommodate. What is it that you do in the state legislature? You, you have an education role there, do you not? I do, I do. I've been very fortunate. Uh, the, uh, when I got elected, the Senate president asked me, uh, you know, traditionally in the, the legislature, you have a K-12 committee, a workforce committee, a higher ed committee, a pre-K committee. And the, the president asked me, John, what do you think about us combining all these committees so that, because they all work, they should work together. Why don't we just make one committee dealing with education? I says, you know, as, as a good freshman, I says, great job, Mr. President, good idea. Uh, and he says, well, good, I'm glad you said that because I want you to be a chairman of that. 
So I'm the chairman of the pre-K through 20 education committee. So whether it's universities or early education, that is the committee that I have the good fortune of chairing. Um, and I tell you what, I, I, I thank the good Lord every day that I have that opportunity to chair that committee because I can't think of a, a greater role to help our economy, help our future than helping, helping our educational system. I think you're absolutely right. If we don't have children who can, well, somebody once said we have to educate both our philosophers and our plumbing, but if mm -hmm. we don't, neither our philosophy nor our pipes will hold water. That is a great, great quote. And, and so what you're doing with your academy, I think is an important facet because you're doing the arts and getting people exposed mm -hmm. to better things. Yes. I, I think that there are a lot of things kids get exposed to that are not better things. Yeah. And you're doing it there. And so in the, in the, what is the goal of your role there as chairman of that committee for the committee to do in the next, let's say five years? You know, what I see in the next five years is a real transition and moving forward in terms of, you know, uh, and to borrow President Obama's uh, phrase that he used to address the website issue, uh, a tech surge, that, that our economy is changing into a digital economy. We know by the year 2018 that in Florida, on its current path, we're going to have a, a 50 to 60 percent work gap in digital technology and digital skills for our future employees. We know the economy is heading that direction. So where I see us heading in the next few years that, that I'm advocating for is really pushing technology, digital skills, digital competency uh, into our K-12 system and even our university system to ensure that the degrees that are being produced match our economy and that our kids, our students are equipped with the skills in order to obtain the jobs of tomorrow. And I, I say this often. How do we do that? Well, what what is... What is, you know, it's easy to say, mm -hmm. I like this, but it's harder to say, I like this and here's how we're going to do it. Well, it, what, it, what it takes, one, it takes, it takes a commitment to starting early, the ensuring of coding, dealing with those skills and uh, uh, programming that we instill those at an early age into our, our, our schools to ensure that, and it costs money, unfortunately. Money makes the world go round. Our schools are not equipped through broadband, high-speed broadband and wireless uh, to ensure that they have the capacity, no matter what device they use, whether it's an iPad or an Android, that they have those, those skills. You know, and, and I use this that not, not everyone's going to college, nor should everyone go to college. That's correct. But everyone should have the skills and the ability to make a living and a wage that's out there. And looking at our c careers, uh, many years ago, we've had you know, the automotive you know, skills, the, 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 the shop classes that we had in the 70s. Well, we don't have those shop classes anymore because it's not your daddy's Votech because the com cars today, they're run off of computers. computers. <laughs> and right. so we have to ensure that our students, our automotive in industries, that is a blue collar industry, really is a high tech skilled job that we can teach at our high school levels. I, I just got a tour of Brandon Honda. Yeah. And John, the, the new owner there, was showing all of this equipment that they have. And it, it's sort of like standing in a Starfleet. Yes. <laughs> with, with all these benches, with all these different meters and gauges. And it, it's fantastic. Uh, if you would have, you know, I, I laugh. I, I have a five-year-old son. And, you know, if we just go back five years and look how much the world has evolved five years ago, you know, with the with the iPad, who would have thought that a tablet, that you could have a tablet in a school that could replace all the textbooks, that you would have platforms where teachers and students can interact with each other, and they call it flip the classroom, where they could actually provide homework assistance off-site, off-campus, off-hours to help students with homework at a low cost. All that technology didn't even exist five years ago. Who knows what the next five years will be? How do you do be? that at low cost? Now, I, I heard you say earlier that your people, all the students, had iPads. Yes, our middle school, all our middle school students have it's a one-to-one -one so deployment. that's seventh and eighth? Uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth Six, grade. Seventh and eighth. They, it's okay. a one-to-one -one deployment. Um, the cost is coming down. You know, it was very expensive five years ago. 
and and you know Moore's Law. So the school provides the iPad, not the not the student. At our particular school, some have bring your own devices. Some schools do the other, but ours is a one to one that the school provides. Wow. Yeah. And, and we've seen great results so far. And you get less money per student than the regular system. We do, we do. Uh, and you can do less. all this? We can, you know, and, but again, we don't have to provide all the sports programs. We, when our parents apply to our school, we tell them, um, you know, if sports is your particular thing, we do offer regular PE, but we don't have a gymnasium. We don't have, you know, athletics that, that there's, we don't have other uh, type of programs that are high cost, that are specialized. We have a very narrow focus, which is high academics, arts, and technology. How do kids get into your school? It's a lottery. A lottery? Lottery, basically, the only way to get into our school is really at kindergarten level, uh, because kindergarten goes to first grade and it moves up. And so, and siblings get preference. So if you have a third grader and a kindergarten that's coming in, oh, I was get gonna, preference. That's, that, I was gonna ask you that, because having them go to, have them go to a grade school to two year from grade schools no, would not be We give thing. preference to existing students that are already in the school. But other than that, we let the school district basically run our lottery. People put their name in the hat. And this year we had over a thousand students apply for 15 slots. Wow. Yeah. So we're very fortunate. You're obviously you're doing something right to have that many parents care enough about to get in a lottery. Because yeah. getting parents to care yeah. about education is one of the biggest challenges in education. It is, it's also one of the biggest successes that we have. But it goes back, it's not my school or John Legg's school, it is the community school that the parents run it, they set the agenda, so. Let's jump to another subject. Yes, sir. You have a district that has a lot of problems with the sinkholes. Yes. What is the state doing to help these folks? What have they done? Maybe some of them don't know that there's available help. Where are we going from here with the uh, sinkholes. Oh, I want to say potholes. <laughs> they're a lot bigger than potholes. They're bigger than potholes. It, you know, it's, it's been a problem for a while, but it's, it's also sometimes, I think, a manufactured problem. I use the number back in 2006, over all year in Citizens, there was four sinkhole claims in, in the whole county. Flash forward one year, there was, there was over 480 claims in one zip code in the same county. So what happened? Did you have all of a sudden all these sinkholes open up in one year? Well, what you had is you had an understanding of the insurances would pay for cracks in the driveway. <laughs> you, um, um, St. Petersburg Times I called it the I won the blue, lottery, I've got a crack. The blue collar lottery. They called it the blue collar lottery, the St. Pete Times call it. We've had a lot of back and forth um, working on the laws over the last eight years on this issue. What we've had is, I call it options. We give our homeowners options. If they want to have additional insurance for full coverage to cover the cracks and the driveways, they can buy up insurance to pay for those issues. If they want just basic sinkhole insurance that covers if a sinkhole opens and a wall falls in or they can visually see a hole, that's called catastrophic coverage, that's covered in the base policy. That was the first thing that we did. The big thing that I think has made the biggest difference is that we call it a requirement to repair. What we saw for a lot, of, for many years, was individuals would claim a sinkhole and never repair their home. They would just cash out, if you will, oh, okay. and never would make a repair. The last couple of years, we've adjusted the laws to say, if you make a sinkhole claim, you must repair the problem. That has decreased the frivolous lawsuits and increased the actual repairs to the home mm -hmm. to fortify them. So I, I think we've gotten ahead of it, um, but it's gonna be an ongoing problem for a couple more years. I would think so. Has anybody addressed the overuse of water? You know, that, that, that's By some of the agriculture, and I'm certain you have a lot of agriculture up there. Uh, we do, we do. And, and you know, Tampa Bay Water uh, has done a great job over the last 10 years of kind of looking at regional plans, looking at a reservoir, desal, usage, diversi diversified sources. Um, but regardless, over pumpage is probably the primary source. And I would say the second is ensuring adequate inspections uh, on when you build new homes. Um, many of these homes that were getting sinkhole claims, many, not all, were homes that were built in the 70s. They were built on orange groves that were quarter inch foundations that were not adequately <laughs> inspected. So obviously you're gonna have settling and major sinkhole issues on those homes. 
those two issues, uh, I think, will go a long way to resolve Are they using any ground radar on, on the new, new houses that are being built to see what's below them? In Pasco County right now, I don't know about Hillsboro, but in Pasco, the county's passed the ordinance where you must do a sinkhole test prior to building a home in order that, to That makes that. some sense to me. Does sometimes common sense eludes us, though. <laughs> but I remember two years ago when we had that big freeze and it got really, yeah. really cold. That's when we had some huge sinkhole problems. Yes. Because the growers were pumping like mad. Yes. And the water was going out of those things. People don't realize that water will hold weight. Yep. And if it isn't there, then boom. Yep. It, it, it uh, causes collapses. And that's, you saw that in Hillsborough County in the, in the Plant City area. You have groves up there to you right now, do you not? You know, our district, or is it? It's kind of shifted. It's, the groves have thinned out over the years. You know, uh, the district that I've been very fortunate to represent uh, is really an urban uh, bedroom community now. The groves, you know, some would say unfortunately, some would say fortunately, have been largely been replaced by neighborhoods and subdivisions in the Wesley Chapel and Trinity area. So uh, we are now a, a more of a bedroom community for Tampa. Speaking of that, then. How do you stand on rapid transit? It would seem to me a, a rapid transit system from Orlando to Tampa, to especially the airport, and with a stop at Bush Gardens, and, and for people to come in, you say it's a better community for Tampa, to get on it and come on in. Because Route 4, I hate. <laughs> I, I avoid Route 4 like the plague. Yep. And, and it, it's not getting any better. How do you feel about rapid transit? Well, we have to look at, we, you know, the current building mega highways is not sustainable and it's expensive. Um, now, we have to make sure that it can pay for itself and that we have a, a, a economical, economical way of building these. You know, what they're doing at Tampa International Airport um, and, uh, is amazing, their future plans. That I love Tampa International. They, I travel a lot, and that's my favorite airport. You know, and we hear that, we hear that nonstop, that Tampa International is one of the best airports to fly in and out of. Unfortunately, once you leave the airport, transportation there becomes a little bit more difficult. <laughs> if you're not <laughs> careful, you end up over in St. Petersburg. <laughs> Take one turn. So we have a lot of planners that are looking at what should be maybe the first leg for a people mover, whether it's rapid buses, whether it's a, whether it's a rail system. Uh, I think all options should be on the table and we should look at what is the best way to create that first leg uh, to get people from the airport to downtown to St. Pete. Um, and I know, I know we'll come up with a solution here shortly. I think if we had a rapid transit from here to Orlando that Tampa would become the destination of choice, not Orlando. I think, I think uh, you know, the governor vetoed the, the money for the rail system. Um, which was spent somewhere else. Which, which, which was the money went somewhere else. Uh, we do, I think it's incumbent upon the leaders of our community, of Tampa, to find a way and partner with the state to find what is the long-term solution. Um, people are moving back into the cities. They are moving back into the cities. Um, and I want to make sure that we uh, are an uh, up-and-coming city, not a city like Detroit. Well, you know, I keep telling people, people don't fly into Brandon. Yeah. They, they, they're not going to Brandon. When they tell people I'm going to Florida, they don't say I'm going to Brandon or I'm going to Sun City Center. They're going to say I'm going to Tampa. Yeah. And if we don't have a healthy core there, yeah. then it's hard to keep the rest of the world around us safe. Yeah. And prosperous. Yeah, and you know, and also what, what's interesting with the, the port of the Panama Canal uh, is, is scheduled to widen and they're widening yes. it now to larger ships. And the port of Tampa with the airport, we are in a we are in a prime location uh, for economic growth. Uh, you know, Tampa Internationals now have Copa Airlines flying to Panama nonstop to there. Uh, with a with the uh, port widening um, the next great city, I, I believe, is going to be the Tampa city, and we are uh, what we do now is, is really critical in laying that blueprint down. I agree, uh, Mark Sharp, who I'm sure you know. Yeah. Mark has literally put his name on the line yeah. when it comes to mass transit because it, I, I, I often wonder if Mark's got Mark's term limiting out this time, <laughs> and I often wonder where, where he's planning to go. Uh, but he has put a lot of effort into making people aware of mass transit around the country. And golly, we were up in Salt Lake City and rode their mass transit, and it's wonderful. Yeah. I haven't done the one in Carolinas yet. Yeah, Charleston. And, you know, and I, I think it's part of the solution. You know, we want to make sure 
We also want to make sure, you know, and this is, I think, we, we've got to be wise with our dollars to ensure whatever we do that we, we don't get it over our heads. But to simply do nothing is not an option. We have to have a plan, and uh, mass transit is, is, is a key part of that. Well, mass transit with wireless on it. Yeah. Where people can get work done on the way home and on the way in, read a book, listen to something, it doesn't matter what, would seem to me to be a, a wonderful investment. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I just don't, I guess I have under, problems understanding why the state legislature doesn't see that, except uh, we, we are parochial. Yeah. You know, we, we have a small section of people that will benefit. Yeah. And they're saying, you know, well, I don't want to run through his land because he'll, he'll benefit here and this. But it seemed to me it would be a really good thing all the way along. Well, you know, I've always been a believer. I'm, I'm a conservative, uh, but I always believe one of the fundamental jobs of government is is infrastructure. You know, um, whether it was Eisenhower in the 50s, whether it was, you know, d doing airports or whatever. Infrastructure is a function of government. And, and we, have to, we have to look and work together collaboratively with Pasco, Hillsboro, uh, Sarasota, Manatee, uh, and work to come up with a regional model, a Pinellas, a regional model that works for our region. And if one particular part of the region benefits short term, we need to allow that to happen so that all of us can benefit. Well, you know, one, one person told me years ago, if there's a hole in the boat, doesn't matter whose end it's in, yeah. you all have to bail. <laughs> exactly, because when, it, when, the, when the ship sinks, we're all going down. That's right, and I think that's what you're saying here. If one benefits a little bit more, it will raise the rest of them up because it'll pay higher taxes. Yeah, they'll, you know, the, the tax rate will, the, the overall revenue will increase for the state and uh, hopefully hopefully a, a, rising, a rising tide will raise all ships. I, I promised you a minute at the end of the program to thank the people that elected you and assure the ones who didn't <laughs> that you would still represent them. Well, so if you go ahead and just talk with the folks and tell them what you think. Well, sure. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here today, Bill. And, and just thank you for the residents of District uh, 17 for, for allowing me to be your servant in Tallahassee. And, and please know that our office is here to assist you on state issues and on county issues. If we can make you with the right connection, we're here to do that. Uh, we, we are here to serve, uh, whether you vote for me or not. Uh, getting reelected is not my pro priority. My priority is, is my, my children's generation and my, my parents ensuring that they have a quality of life. And whatever we can do to work together to make our community a better place, I'm here to be your servant. So thank you for allowing me to be your voice and your advocate in Tallahassee. One last person we haven't talked about. We, we only have just about 30 seconds, but we'd like to mention her name. Would you tell us your wife? My wife is named Suzanne Legg. She's the love of my life. I love her dearly, and I couldn't serve without her. She takes on more responsibility than the world will ever know. I, I have found that it's like being a pastor's wife when you're elected <laughs> to a politician. Yes. You have to do things also. Yes. Well, John Legg, I am so pleased that you took time out of a very busy day to come over here and talk with us. I hope you'll come back. Will you give me a promise to come I back? I promise I'll come back for you to yell at me, to talk to me, whatever you would like. So thank <laughs> be you. Be no yelling at the, on this program. This is for you to be able to tell your people what you believe. Well, thank you. I want to thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Bill Hodges. This is Spotlight on Government. Thank you for being with us. We really appreciate it. It's your show. If you have guys and gals that you want to be on, you tell us about it. And if they're within the purview of the show, we'll do it. You're unique, you're special, and you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know. And we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. And again, Senator Legg, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate your being here. Thank you. Hace dos años tuve la oportunidad de venir a los Estados Unidos a trabajar limpiando casas para un hombre y me dijo que tenía que acostarme con unos hombres. Fueron 25 hombres al día. Nos podías escuchar llorando hasta que nos quedábamos dormidos. 